for a few weeks and for a few weeks yet to come we plan to spend a little time in the first three chapters of Genesis and we'll see what the Lord has in mind after that and one of the things that uh, we deal with well many things we deal with in Genesis 1 2 and 3 you deal with the creation itself which includes creation of humanity it also involves the calling of mankind which is what I'm going to deal with today and it, and it deals with the failure of uh, basically mankind especially as it uh, relates to Adam and what he did which has affected us all so Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and as you can see I'm picking out a few specific themes each week the one today has to do with the kingdom dominion that God intended for mankind to function with was lost and then it has been restored Genesis 1 26 God said let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them and of course we if you read all three chapters uh, uh, Adam and Eve together are considered to be the combination or the culmination of mankind it is mankind let them have dominion over the fish of the sea the birds of the air over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them then God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it he's going to say this again have dominion over the fish of the sea the birds of the air over every living thing that moves on the earth and God said see I have given you talking to mankind every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food also to every beast of the earth to every bird of the air to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life I have given every green herb for food and it was so verse 31 and God saw everything that he had made and it indeed it was very good so the evening and the morning they were the sixth day now twice in that section I just read it speaks of dominion and he's saying to Adam and Eve both I have set you here to have dominion there is debate today as to what all God actually intended that to mean but he basically said the whole earth not only all the created world as we know it but the whole earth have dominion and one of the elements of that that some people don't really want to deal with is he put us here to be custodians of the earth and to do a good job of that for instance in your house where you live or your car or anything else that you are custodian of it's good to keep it well Proverbs talks about uh, how we should keep what God has given us to to keep let's say you have a house you know keep it clean order it as best as possible these are these are what we might call simplistic things but it's still part of the call so it was with this earth that we're living on and in many ways mankind has really polluted this earth now I'm not getting into stuff that people want to fight about today uh, talking about global warming and all that I'm just talking about what's obvious we have polluted the earth in so many ways we've taken good things and made them not so good now mankind has also done some things that are good so that's just a little piece of what he's talking about when he said have dominion he does care about the world we're living in because he created us to have dominion over it well the problem as we know comes in in chapter 2 at verse 16 the Lord commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden you may freely eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die <clears throat> now this is for those of us that have the privilege of seeing the whole Old and New Testaments put together and seeing the greater picture of God this makes all kinds of sense to us but Adam and Eve they really were in a very innocent state they had no sin they were not sinners they just were created in the, in the image of God and he said I'm gonna give you everything and I'm gonna have you have dominion over everything but there's one tree in this garden which apparently was just amazing 
the garden was. One tree, he said, of that fruit you shall not eat. If you do, you will die. And the Lord, and we'll deal with that uh, next week or the week after about what they actually did. We know what they did, but... And the Lord said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And that was in last week's message. But it bears into this having dominion. They're together in this thing. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Now, I've heard people talk about this before. That would have taken a while. All the animals and birds, just, just all the animals and birds, the ones on the surface of the ground. And why did God do that? Well, he said, I want you to have the dominion. He's talking to Adam and Eve. Now, that dominion was never intended to be a dominion apart from the dominion of the Almighty God. Because God is always going to be God and he always should have been God. And what they didn't understand yet is what submitting to the authority of God was to them. It was the best and the only thing. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. We'll be talking about that here in a minute. Kelly said he read the verses well ago, we're not our own, we were bought with a price. Well, in these days of beginnings, God said, I want you to have dominion. He's talking to mankind. And he said, and you can basically have everything. And the truth is, they could do everything and do anything, except one thing, just, just one thing. There's a fruit of a tree that you're not going to be able to eat of that. If you do, you will die. And I could get into a lot of that stuff later, and we may at some point. But he said, don't do it. So in Genesis 3, 6, this is now after the devil has come to test her. I'm going to talk about that again in a separate morning. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. Now she got part of that from just seeing it, part of it from what the devil said. But those are the three things that John talks about in the New Testament. He said the only thing in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's those three right there. Good for food, that's the lust of the flesh. And again, food's not a bad thing, but it's not to control us. When Jesus was tested by the devil several hundreds of years later than this, the devil tested him in three areas. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And he had to defeat the devil in all three, or you and I would have gone to hell. And he did. So it was with Adam and Eve. They were going to be tested in all three of these areas, and they failed. Now, if that would have been the end of the story, that would have been a terrible story. But it is not the end of the story. But it was the lust of the flesh that's good for food. Pleasant to the eyes, she said. That's the lust of the eyes. That's the things we see. And it's desirable to make one wise. That's the pride of life. It dominates this world. Those three things dominate the world you live in. One way or another, everything that we deal with that's in the fallen mankind, sinful world, is found in one of those three areas. So when she saw this, it says, she took of the fruit and she ate and gave it to her husband with her and he ate. We'll talk again of this more in the next week or two. She was convinced that the Lord was trying to keep something good from them. And the devil was convincing her that that was true. And so she looked at it and she decided, okay, she didn't know who the serpent was. He was talking to her. She didn't know that he was trying to ruin her life for eternity. But she believed him. She believed him. So she took the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave it to her husband and he ate. Again, we'll touch on some of that issue a little bit later. In Romans 5.12, here in the New Testament, Paul says that through one man, that would be Adam, sin entered the world. Death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. One of the theological questions that you find if you go to Bible school and uh, seminaries and even if you just do your own study, you'll hear it today in videos and things that people, messages, is why would God let this happen? He knew it was going to happen. 
And why did he let it happen? The devil had already taken, tried to take on God and lost and was kicked from heaven, where he was called Lucifer at, the, at that time. And he took with him a bunch of angels that wanted to follow him, which is kind of mind-blowing to me how that could even be. But anyway, all of these created beings decided they wanted to go against the one that created them, which is just asinine. But they did. And Paul said because of that, what Adam did, and, and in the scripture primarily he speaks of what Adam did, what he did caused sin to enter the world and then death. Not just in the world, but every human being that would follow, with one exception. There was one that came about 2,000 years ago, and he is a human being, and he was, and, and he still is, he's God too. And that's Jesus, he was born through another means, through his mother's womb, and he, didn't, he wasn't born a sinner. But every other person has been that. The brother of Jesus, James, says it this way in 1.14. He said, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That's what happened to Eve. When desire has conceived, it gives, gives birth to sin. Sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. That's what happened back there. Now, they weren't sinners yet, but they had the capacity to choose right and wrong, even though they didn't really understand what that was. They just knew that the God had created them. And you know, I don't know what kind of experiences they'd had with God prior to this, but we know that they knew Him and that God knew them. And so what took place in this circumstance not only changed their whole world, but it also changed all of us and our world. And one of the things that took place that day is the dominion was lost. Not only did mankind become sinners separated from God that's what death is death is when we're separate from the source of life but but also mankind lost that place of dominion we know that when we read the New Testament the scripture says that the devil took that dominion because what happened here were two masters that Eve and Adam were before one was the master God the other was the master devil, and they chose the wrong master. When they chose to submit to the master of the devil, he became the one that had the dominion. Not that he is dominion over God himself, or in the truest sense, even over the entire earth, but the script, uh, scripture calls him the prince of the power of the air. He's here on this earth trying to influence people away from God. So that dominion, that is a big deal to God, I do not hear enough of this in the church world today, understanding what God means by that. We're going to talk more of that today, of course. But that dominion that was lost is just equally as important as the fact that they all died as sinners, too. They became sinners, they died, and then they lost the dominion of the creation that God created them to have dominion over. It would be very much like if you owned a business and you hired someone to be the one to oversee that business, to be the manager, the, the authority. And then that person decided they didn't want to follow your standard. You're the one that created the business. You're the one that hired them. They want to fire, f follow some other source out here and go astray. And this is exactly what Adam and Eve did. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, that would be, in this case, they'd live forever rather than die. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden. He lost his dominion. He lost his place. He lost his dominion. And he sent him out to till the ground from which he was taken. And he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life. We'll get to that later. Tree of Life is re representative of Christ himself. There would be a day that God was going to fix this. He already knew what he was going to do. And he knew what Adam and Eve were going to do. 
So he already had a plan, and that plan ultimately was to save us, but he was going to have to become one of us to do it. But in that he drove man out of that garden, mankind lost their dominion, the one they were supposed to be practicing under the authority of the Almighty God. Well, as we already know, Jesus Christ, many hundreds of years later, He comes, and it's God became one of us. One of the things He came to do was to save us from our sin nature. We know that. Very big deal. But one of the other things that He came to do among about four or five, but I'm just going to talk about this one, He came to restore the dominion to mankind where it's supposed to be. Because, you see, God created this earth for us to have dominion over. And when that's not happening, it's like this. Things aren't right. Things are not right when they're not right. That's what the word righteousness is. It means things are right. But when they're not right, they're not right. And this earth is in a lot of turmoil today because a lot of things aren't right. The dominion that was intended for God to have working through Him into His people for a big portion of the world that we've lived in for now several thousand years hasn't been working right. So when Jesus came, He came to st turn this around, to begin the process to fix this. So in Luke 131, this is when the angel Gabriel is talking to Mary. He said, You, Mary, will conceive in your womb. You'll bring forth a son and you'll call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. You see, God had to restore the dominion through mankind. This is God's way. It had to happen. There are a lot of people, I didn't know this in the first 21 years of my Christian life, I didn't realize how big a deal Scripture makes about the kingdom of God today and then forever to come. It's a big deal. And it had to happen. Not only did Jesus, didn't, not only did God have to become a man to fix us, to save us from sin, but he also had to become a man to restore the kingdom. The Father's kingdom through him and then through us. And he said he will reign and of his kingdom there will be no end. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach, this is after he's baptized in the Jordan, he began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> I was thinking about a message this morning that hasn't been written yet, uh, one that God was putting in my heart, that it fits with the word repent there, because when you really know what the word means, it just means Turn around to the right direction. If we've sinned, we need to repent. If we're going in the wrong direction, we need to repent. There have been a few times that I've been driving down the road and got going the wrong direction. We have GPS now, and that helps. Although, that GPS gal, sometimes she and I don't always jee-haw. <laughs> there have been a few times that she's led me astray, and I, I'll hold to that, even though she may say, not so, not so, Rick, I knew what I was doing. But. If I'm going the wrong way, I need to turn around and go the right way. That's what to repent means. And there's so much about where our current world is that is going to get fixed only as they repent. But that means to turn and go toward the Lord. After the outpouring of the Spirit, Peter preaches the first message he ever preached, anointed by the Spirit in this, this way. And he begins to tell them about Jesus. And it said there was this crowd there and they were listening and they were overwhelmed. In fact, it says they were cut to the heart. You know, when the Word of God is doing its thing, because the Word of God's alive and it's sharp and it's powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, it can cut a person to the heart. And it did. And they said, what do we do? And Peter said, you need to repent. What did he mean? Well. Our first thought as Christians growing up in this Christian world is they need to repent of their sin, and that's true. Of course we do. Well, it'd be an impossibility for someone that's 20 or 30, 40 years to be able, years old to go back and, and just categorize every sin they've ever committed. 
They need to repent that they are and have sinned. True. But there's more to it than that. To turn from the direction they're going, as Kelly read earlier, doing their own thing, to now I've been bought with a price. I belong to someone else. That's what repentance is. He said, repent, be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and receive the promise of the Father. That's the person of the Holy Spirit. That's another message. We'll get to that one day, I think. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. It's at hand. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I went to Bible school, started in 1970, 78, I think it was. I believe it was 78 in January. First class I took was, was gospels class, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they were talking about, and this was the message, the gospel of the kingdom. That's all Jesus ever preached, the gospel of the kingdom. That involved him as the king. It involves him as the savior. It involves us as his people. But the only message, the only message Jesus preached was the gospel of the kingdom. Why is that? Because when God created Adam and Eve, he said, I want you to have dominion. But you're going to need to do it led by me. And he said, there's only one thing you can't do. Well, the kingdom was at stake. The dominion was at stake. And they chose the wrong thing. They chose to disobey. And therefore, they sent in motion and created a whole humanity to follow that come out of the womb as sinners, rebellious, self-righteous sinners. And Jesus came to fix that, but he also came to fix this kingdom problem. Matthew 4, 23, he went about Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness, all kinds of disease among the people. In Matthew 12, 28, Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. There are people today that don't believe in demons. <clears throat> they don't believe in the devil. Around Halloween, they like to go see scary movies, but they really don't believe in those things. But Jesus, who is the creator of heaven and earth and knows all things, he said, uh, this world exists. The demonic world does exist. And for those of us today in the world we're living in today that are, we call it postmodern, I guess we're post-postmodern now, and we're so civilized and so wise and so smart that we don't need to believe in God, firstly, and secondly, we don't need to believe in demons and the devil. And the thing is, both are still there. God is still God, and He's still here, and there still is a devil, and there's still demons. John 18, 36, Jesus said to Pilate, He said, My kingdom is not of this world, meaning it's not a worldly kingdom. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. He said, This wouldn't be going this way if my kingdom was of this world. But He said, Now, my kingdom is not from here. And I've preached messages about this. There are people today that are Christian peoples, at least some are, that want to reestablish the Davidic type kingdom, the one that David had where we fight with swords and, and guns and, bat and do battle that way. And, and we're missing the point. Now, nations are still fighting. And if I had been drafted, and I almost was, uh, back in 1973 to the Vietnam War, I would have gone. But that's a different thing entirely than the wars that were fought in scriptural days. Totally a different thing. I would have gone. It was, as we know, they, they still had in those days a what they call a lottery to pick how the order of drafting young men, mostly boys at that time, and so when you turned 18, you had to register for the draft, which I did. And then they would, at a certain point in that year, they would have this lottery. Now this isn't the kind where you win millions. It's a totally different lottery. And your birthday number is like, for instance, if you were born in January 15th, your number would be 15 on that ball or on that piece of paper, and I'm not sure which way it was. My number was 
in November 24, so it is a big number, but that has nothing to do with when you got drafted. They put all of those numbers in a big pile, and they would draw out one number at a time. And that number would represent a birth date. And that birth date would represent a young man, or many young men usually. And so how the draft typically worked is if you were picked in the first 100, at least, you were likely, you're going to be drafted. Unless you have some kind of a medical excuse or something like that, you will be drafted. Even probably the first couple hundred more than likely would be because the Vietnam War was still going on. And people that I knew and relatives were dying. They were coming back deformed, legs blown off, many that have died over there. So I grew up with that war. I knew of that war most of my, at least, teen years. And so my number came up, I forget what it was, 40 something maybe. I was gonna get drafted. See, I know this. I'm in high school. I know I'm going to be drafted. In that same year, Nixon pulled us out of Vietnam. That same year. And the same year, they also quit doing the draft. Like I said, I would have gone. I, I don't know what my life would have been different, how that would have gone, but, but that's not how God had it be, so that was it. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not that kind of kingdom. It's a different kingdom. Now, Jesus Christ, his church, and the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about that just for a few minutes. Jesus, when he was talking to his fellers, as Grandpa would say, uh, they wanted him to teach them how to pray. Now, see, they'd prayed all their life. But when he prayed, it was different. And they said, teach us how to pray. So he said, this is how you pray. And you know the prayer, and we won't go through the whole prayer today. But he said, say, my Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the beginning points. After you've worshiped and adored the Lord God himself, the first thing on the list, Lord, let your kingdom come. Your will be done. And he wants us to pray that way. This is still something that's fascinating to me that I'm not sure all Christians really get this. Many times we pray when we're having an issue, if we're sick or, or had a tragedy in life or a situation with our jobs, and all of these things are good, right? We should be praying for all these things. But the first thing on the list is not about that so much as about God bringing his kingdom to prevail on this earth because that's a big deal to God. And secondly, it should be a big deal to us. So he said, when you're praying, pray that way. So how many times you and I are facing a circumstance? Leaving out the things that are going on out here in the world with the elections and the wars and all that. Let's leave that for a moment. Let's just talk about your circumstance. The place you work, your family, the people that you care about, the things that are going on in your world, your proximity. I think one of the most important things for us to recognize is that we need to ask the Father for His kingdom to come, His will to be done. Kelly read it again this morning. I'm saying it, that's probably the third time I've mentioned it. He read from the scriptures that said, you, you're not your own. You belong to someone else. You were bought with a price. That's what the kingdom of God is about. He purchased us, not in the old uh, fallen way of slavery, but we in, in essence are his servants, his bond servants, as Paul put it. And we don't belong to ourselves. So God wants to restore kingdom order here on this earth. But he's not going to do it with guns and cannons and missiles. Now, nations will use those things. And I'm not trying to declare neither here nor there about that. But I'm talking about the kingdom of God. He wants to set things back right. And he started doing it in the Old Testament just by giving them the word and the law and the conscience of God. But then when Jesus came, he came to fix this. And he said, now, now the kingdom has come. It has come near you. It's come. Why? Because he's the king. 
And he then defeated the devil. The first man that lived his entire life without sinning was Jesus. First man. Now he's given us the grace to do exactly the same. But in that not sinning, we're also causing his kingdom to come and for things to be made right that are not. And you'll say, but I'm just little old me, you know, how much influence can I have? Well, when there's a lot of little old me's throughout the whole world that know Jesus, that are doing this, they're setting things right. The kingdom of God is being established. I know it's not finished yet. I'll read that here in a minute. But we're headed in that direction. Paul said in Colossians 1.13 that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and he conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his life, love. And Luke chapter 12.32 Jesus said it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Why? Because that was the plan all along. He gave Adam and Eve, if you can use this terminology, the kingdom. And they sinned and they lost dominion. They lost the kingdom. Jesus is now saying through what he is doing in restoring mankind to a place that he, can, he and she can live in the heart of God, that he's restoring the kingdom. And he said, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus said in John 3, verse 3, he said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot hear this, see the kingdom of God. You will not, people out here that are not born again can't really understand what I'm talking about. Oh, their head might be able to conceptualize some of the things I'm saying, but people that don't know the Lord, they're not born again, they cannot see the kingdom. And this Nicodemus, who was a, a, a Jewish leader of sorts, he said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter, enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you have to be born again to both see the kingdom and then enter the kingdom. And there again, a lot of Christian people that I don't think understand what I'm talking about. They certainly want to be saved to go to heaven. And I'm all for that. They want to be saved to not go to hell. All for that too. But do they understand what God really created mankind to be on this earth? That we are to be the dominioners. We're to be the people that establish the kingdom of what? The kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of Israel as we know it in the flesh. The kingdom of the United States. The kingdom of Japan. It's the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Not that everything that's going on in the world is terrible, but that's not what his kingdom is about. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus said this. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, how can we understand that? Well, firstly, the king is. He's in us, right? If we're born again, the king lives inside of us. But the kingdom of God is actually within me. Now, this is something that really matters to God. For me to understand that I have been called to a calling and I represent him and in this calling his kingdom needs to dwell not only in me but then expressed from me out of me it is in me and out of me you will not establish the kingdom of God on this earth if it doesn't start in you it has to be in your heart the kingdom of God has to be in your heart and Hebrews 12, 28 says, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Back in Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What's he talking about? He's saying, let's put the priorities right. What was he talking about in that context? People worry about what they're going to wear, what they're going to eat. We're probably worried about that right now as to what we're going to eat here in a few minutes. They worry about... Uh, houses, about jobs. Listen, these things matter. Jesus is not saying they don't matter. He's saying seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
How many times in my life, and I'll not ask you about you, but how many times in my life, having been a Christian pretty much my whole life, have I gotten off there just by forgetting how to start things off with what's first? Seek first the kingdom of God. For instance, if you're going to seek someone to marry, seek the kingdom of God to guide us there. If you're looking for a job or a change, seek the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means God has a plan. He's got it all mapped out. We may not know it yet, but we're discovering it, right? Everyone in this room knows what I'm talking about. We're discovering every day things that God's already had planned. And we're coming to Him and saying, I want your kingdom. I want your will. I want this to be right. You see, it's my call. It's my call for his kingdom to come in my heart and then through my life. And so he said, here's the priority for your life. And it really is the way to make life simple. If you really want to make your life simple, start off with everything you're dealing with of any consequence. Seek first. What is the kingdom of God? What is the will of God? Some will say, well, I don't always know right away. Well, that can be true. <laughs> that can be true. Find my tissue here. It can be true, but it's not an excuse to go ahead and fake it until you make it. I've heard Christians say that one too. Listen, that's just downright stupid. Let's don't be doing that. Let's wait on the Lord until we get direction. There's ample examples in the Old Testament where God's teaching people how to walk by faith. And sometimes they got Yancey and decided to go ahead and do their own thing. King Saul was one of those. He was told what to do by the prophet. And he went and did part of it, but didn't do all of it. And then he got Yancey because the prophet hadn't got back around to see him yet and decided he wanted to make some sacrifice here. And he wasn't told to do it that way. See, that's the key. It wasn't that what he was doing was a bad thing. It's that God said he didn't tell him to do it like that. There was, a, and there was a case back in the days when the ark had been taken captive because of the sinful uh, Jewish peoples, the Israel, Israelites, and the ark had been taken captive, and it was held in another place for 70 years. I'm going to be 70 here in a few days. 70 years. And Saul, uh, King Saul was, was the king in an intermediary time there, and he never one time we have record of him wanting to go get that ark. It wasn't until the man after God's own heart, David, became king. One of the first things he wanted to do was go get that ark because it represented the presence of God and bring it back. Well, in that bringing it back, David made a boo-boo. He made a few, by the way. But he made a boo-boo and they didn't seek the Lord about how to transport that ark. There was a way. They were supposed to have priests put poles through the rings on that altar, lift up those poles, and carry the ark on their shoulders. They weren't to do it any other way. Well, they, they went out and bought a new vehicle, a new, new cart, it says. It was a new one, you know, a shiny new one with nice wheels and the latest technology. And they put the ark on it, and they start bringing the ark, thinking this is a good thing, right? How can God not be happy with this? And they're bringing the ark along and it hit a rut and it started to tip off the cart and one of the priests reached out to stabilize it and God killed him. Yikes! Well, that made David angry. Now think about that just a minute. Angry at the one that created us, that has all things in mind good for us. So after he calmed down, and I'd say a few of us have done this before. After he calmed down, he went and sought the way it was supposed to have been done. And then they did it the right way. So it is in our lives, there's so many times that we don't seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Not that we're doing it intending to be rebellious, we just aren't thinking. You know, we tend to live more like mere men sometimes in this life. And I had this happen to me last week. There was a situation that arose, and it was a, uh, a physical situation. 
you guys ever have physical things going on? I'm talking about your body. You know that thing you're sitting in right now? And, and I, I realized that I was thinking about a solution and I haven't asked God about it yet. How easy is it to pick up an aspirin or, or to do some of the things we know are there and oftentimes is not, harm, is not wrong to do. But in this one case, the Lord stopped me. I was walking through the house and I was planning on my self-medication, you know, thing. And the Lord reminded me I hadn't asked him to heal me. Now, is that stupid of me or, or not? I hadn't even asked him. I guess I thought, well, this is kind of a little thing. I'm asking him for so many big things, I guess we'll leave that little thing off. I wasn't intending it to be cantankerous. I just wasn't thinking. And, and I, I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I want you to heal me. And then, if you have other things in mind for me to do, I want you to show me that too. So, Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And he had said in Matthew 16, verse 19, he said, I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking to his apostles, his disciples, but he's talking to you and me today. Whatever you bind on earth, it will be bound in heaven. That's in the spirit world. Whatever you loose on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. Now Jesus gives us another teachable moment here in Matthew 13. The disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus said, this is his answer. It has been given to you to know, to see, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. He's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about seeing the kingdom. But whoever does not have, meaning he doesn't see it, even what he has will be taken from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For, and this is the key, verse 15, For the hearts of this people have grown dull. That's their fault. <clears throat> it's not God's fault, that's their fault. Their ears are hard of hearing. That's because they don't want to hear. And their eyes they have closed, and listen to the word, lest... They should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest then they should understand with their hearts and turn, that's to repent, so that I should heal them. He said they don't want to. He was talking about his own children here, the Jewish people. He wasn't just talking about people out in the world. He was saying these folks don't want to hear. And therefore, because of that, they're blind. They don't see the kingdom. There are Christians, I'm sure today, that are in this category. I'm not saying they won't go to heaven, but I'm saying they have a blindness in that they're still thinking they're in charge. They don't understand the kingdom of God. The, one of the primary reasons that Jesus died on a cross was to restore who we were called to be. Our calling was to have kingdom dominion in life. In order for that to happen, the king has to live in my heart, and I have to want him to be there. Secondly, then I have to want to do what he says. And this is a, oftentimes a lifelong transformation process. Not always do we start off as young Christians wanting immediately to obey the Lord all the time. It would be wonderful if they did, but not all kids do. And then if you're born again when you're 30 or 40, not always are we that quickly going to turn. So we have to come to the Word which teaches us and the Holy Spirit which guides us and say, I need to know how to live this kingdom life. He said, if they would listen to me, if they would, then they would turn. That's the word repent. Then they would turn and I would heal them. But he said, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Uh, again, I can't explain why it's true that some people in this world don't want to hear the truth. We'll talk more of that in the next two or three weeks. 
Also, we're going to finish this by saying Christ and his church are going to finish the kingdom. They're going to finish it. We're in it now. They're going to finish it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Paul said, then comes the end. Well, when, when is then? He's going to tell us. When Jesus delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule, all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. That's, that's when it's all finished. That's when the kingdom of God is finished on this earth. Revelation 11:15. There was a time when God was showing John some visions. And one of those visions, it said the seventh angel sounded. That was the trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. That means that the United States and China and Russia and Iran and Japan and Canada and Mexico, the kingdoms of this world. That can also include businesses. Businesses, there are many these days that are, have a bigger uh, GDP than some nations. That's a kingdom of sorts. The kingdoms of this world will all become the kingdoms of Jesus Christ and he will turn them over to the Father. He said that's when we're finished. Revelation 5 verse 9. You are worthy, talking of Jesus, to take the scroll, to open its seals. For you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe, every tongue, every people and every nation. That's a good news for me that people of every walk of life in all of history, there are people in all of those groups that God is re redeeming. And then they said, he said, and you, they, have, they said, you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. That's the kingdom of God. Then Revelation 22, verse 3, there shall be no more curse, talking about when all things are finished, when the kingdoms are finished and given to the Father, the devil has been put in the lake of fire, and we've been dealing with this. He said, the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. What he's talking about there is the, is the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. His servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. We're talking about a future time now, although we can be and should be doing this now. They will see his face. His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now Paul, back in Paul, and I know I'm bouncing around a lot here, but I'm talking about the establishment of the kingdom of God. And Paul said, finally, my brethren, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. That's the only way we're going to uh, restore the dominion through our lives. The power of God. This morning as I was praying and thinking, I re remembered that verse, those words in, Ze in uh, Zechariah. It's not by might, it's not by power. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. That's what he's talking about. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word stand is the word anthistami. It's where we get the word antihistamine. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And this is true. Listen, people can do you wrong. And they can do you wrong a lot. But where did it come from? It came through demonic forces. He said, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So Paul said this in a, in a prayer in Ephesians 1, verse 19. I'm praying, he said, that the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ. I skipped some words earlier. He's saying, I want your eyes to be enlightened to see this. The exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. He's the king. He's the king of kings. He is far above all principality, power, might, dominion, 
every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet, that's Jesus, and gave him to be head over all things, listen to this, to the church. He gave Jesus, who is over everything, to the church. That doesn't mean we're in charge of Jesus. It means he was given over to us. And he's in charge, and it says he was given to the church, which is his body, which is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Those words are so chocked full of truth and meaning. Today, we have a new king, and he's been a king now for about 2,000 years. And he's not just a king, he's the king of kings. He's at the Father's right hand, and he's in charge, and he is ruling from that place. But how is he ruling? Primarily through you and me. Why? Because he's also inside of us through the person of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is in me because the king is in me. And so as I seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, I am establishing the kingdom now. And listen, the Lord loves it. You and I know this, that people we care about, when we see them doing well, we love it, right? Whether they're children or family members or people we know and love, when you see people doing right, we love it. The father looks down and he's looking through his son and he's looking to see where his son is at in this earth and he's all over the place. He's in Craig and Suzanne. He's in all the people in this room. He's in people probably out here in this hotel. He's in people all over this world and the father is looking and he's seeing those people. He's seeing who? The king inside of those folks. And what's he looking for? Well, he's looking to see if we want to let that kingdom be and work through us to let that dominion that Adam and Eve messed up so royally be restored to us in Christ and not just that we have Jesus and we're going to heaven which is such a wonderful thing but that he's now establishing the kingdom so at direct TV where a friend of mine works God is establishing the kingdom through that individual right at Cox Health, which almost everybody else in the room works, except for about three or four. At the Assemblies of God, Evangel University. What do you call your business? Is there a name? Suzanne's Place. <laughs> we like kids. In all of these places, we are establishing the kingdom. Everywhere you go, he told, um, he told Joshua when Moses died, he said, now it's time. We're going to take these two million across the Jordan into the promised land. He said, every place you step on, every place your feet trod, I'm going to give it to you. So in a way, that's how, how it is for you and me. Now, I'm not saying that you can go down here, well, you just go down here to the lobby and say, I, I, I own this place now, I own the Hilton Garden Inn. It's mine. That's not what we're saying. We're saying you're led by the Spirit. And everywhere you go, as you go, there's a dominion he's establishing wherever you go. How's he doing that? You're just obeying him. It's pretty simple. It's not by might, not by power, it's by the Spirit of God this is happening. But you know, he's using us. And we just need to get this straight. It really matters to God that we line up and let his kingdom come and his will be done. Craig, you want to help me, please? You're well, Father, you've been taking me on a path now for several years that uh, in many ways, I would never have gone myself, that's for sure, but, but in this path, you've been teaching me how to just hear your voice and to obey you, and I'm so grateful for that. So grateful for your mercy, your compassion, your long-suffering. So many, so many times I have been slow to hear. And Lord, even when we haven't meant to do that, it's still true. 
but we look at our own children and people we care about, we recognize that there's a timing of, of maturity and development. You're so patient with us. You're so good to us. In fact, it's your goodness that even leads us to repentance. And I'm so thankful today, Lord, that you've, you've stayed with me and borne with me all these years because you had a plan, you always did. You chose me in Christ before the foundations of the world. You took me from my mother's womb and you've been with me ever since. So it has been with every person in this room. So it has been with all that are yours. And Lord, we're learning every day how amazing you are and how amazing is what you have done for us and are doing. Scripture says, Lord, that all things are ours in Christ. You've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And I think we're just really, just beginning to even understand what that really means. You've given us a power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, defeated the demons and the devil, and, and has, has done miracles throughout history, cataclysmic, God-like miracles. It's the same power that's inside of us right now. There's no shortage of your power. No shortage of your wisdom and knowledge. And you want to do it through us. How amazing that you want to rule your kingdom through us, your people. So today, Lord, I'm grateful that you, you decided to come and get me, to save me, to love me, to lead me, to guide me, to transform me. And I'm thankful that you're not finished with me and with others of us as well. I'm grateful that you truly are the all and in all. And as the song says, Lord God, you're, you're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. It's absolutely true. Even if we don't understand it, it is still true. <clears throat> and you're all, all I want. You're all I've ever needed You're all I want, Lord I'm so glad you're always Let's sing it one more time. Just put our hands on our hearts and sing it to the Lord. And you're all, all I want you are, Lord. You're all I have ever needed. You're all, all I want, Lord. I'm so glad you're always here.